It was uh, this is uh, it was it was Kimberger in 1966 in his famous Economist uh, article that he he used the word minority view, but he did not invent it. It was actually um, John H. Williams um, in his testimony to Congress um, about Bretton Woods, um, where he referred to his view as a minority view, and it was a key currency approach that John H. Williams sort of got started, um, trying to think about the transition from the sterling system, um, which was collapsing after World War I, um, to a, a possible dollar system. Um, and that's the origin of it. And what I took as my challenge for this audience of historians of economic thought is to try to say, well, since I think it's basically right, you know, why, why is it resisted? Why is it such a minority view? Um, so this seems to have been confirmed by history. And so just to take that puzzle as a kind of let's look at economics and let's try to understand why why this view has had uh, such a difficult time making its way, you will see, so I can lead with the, the punchline at the end, um, that in some ways it's I've just I've gone beyond the paper I did in Rome to say that I think that it's a similar uh, problem to understanding money period. okay? you some of you may remember in previous talks, I talk about the four the four reasons that money is difficult. Um, and uh, alchemy, hierarchy, hybridity, and stability, um, and that our, that sort of psychological resistance to those four features gets in the way of our understanding how the money system works. There's a version of that for the international uh, uh, version of the money view, which I take the key currency to be. So here, so let me just start. So the... Um, uh, uh, Alex was talking about um, the MOOC. Um, these are the two books um, that where is my attempt to use the my view, what I what I learned in developing the MOOC um, as a, as a frame, one for understanding the evolution of the Fed from 1913 to the present. That was my 1911 book. So that's using the money view as an analytical frame for understanding um, institutional evolution. And in the, my most recent book, I'm doing the same thing, um, except I'm using looking at the international monetary system, and I'm using the international version of the money view, which I take to be the key currency uh, uh, approach. Um, and so what I want to do today in the next couple of minutes, um, whereas last year I kind of walked down the left-hand column here, the book is a biography of a man, end of the dollar. Um, the left-hand column is the chapters, um, and the three phases of, of, of Kindleberger's life. Um, and, uh, I put in red here so that you can see, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Okay. Which is the parallel story of the, of the evolution of the dollar system. You can see that it parallels Charlie's life. You know, he was born in 1910. The Fed was born in 1913. Um, he got his first academic job in 1948. The international monetary system was sort of blessed at Bretton Woods in 1944. Um, and he uh, had a mandatory retirement in 76, um, right at the period when the dollar system, death and rebirth, Volcker shock. So he had a third career um, watching all of that. So I'm just going to follow down mostly the, the right-hand column. Um, if you read the book, you'll some people read the book really just as a bi biography, okay? And I, when I was interacting with the um, with the working group that was reading the book, um, I noticed that <laughs> that that may, maybe this is a my my desire to make a readable book um, made it read too much as just a biography, and I didn't highlight enough the extent to which it's really a revisionist history of the international monetary system. Um, okay, so that's what I want to highlight today. Okay. Okay, first, and then I want to ask, why is this a minority view? So, so here's here's the view that is the minority view. Um, uh, I should also announce that uh, my I have a website um, for the book um, that I also want to um, to share with you, um, where there are also uh, there's a little. Uh, there's chapter summaries with pictures. There's no pictures in the book because I didn't want the book to be expensive, um, but the pictures are posted for free on the internet. Um, also book reviews, book talks. So for example, I put a, I just added a link to that podcast with Rob Johnson now there. And, and one of the things, which I think you might find fun, um, quotable Kindleberger, I pulled out, um, he was a very good writer and, and creator of epigrams. And so I collected them and I just put them all up there and they sail past you in the slideshow. And that could be fun too. I, I'm going to add more stuff on that, on that site. Um, I have graduate students helping me, uh, with that. And so little by little, we'll, we'll put more fun stuff. And if you have other ideas 
for I'm trying to create a timeline, uh, for example, that that is that that to really make make clear the three stories and that are in this book: um, the man, the dollar, and also the history of thought, the evolution of of thought. That isn't there yet, but that's coming soon, hopefully. So here's the point, okay? The key currency uh, view, um, which Jay said in the in the introductory remark, is 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 a is a money view of the international monetary system. In my in my understanding, in my interpretation, um, what that what that means briefly, okay, is that we're we're thinking of short-term capital flows between countries as analogous to uh, correspondent balances, dom domestic bankers' balances um, that are are. Are moving instead of instead of international reserves. You know they're 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 an extra uh, layer of elasticity. The balance of payments, okay, for a country, therefore appears not so much as a NEPA thing, national income product account things, but it's the settlement constraint that that's the form that the settlement constraint takes at the international level, um, where payments have to be made in international money. So that's the the, the constraint. Um, in this international frame, um, we have, which we don't have in the domestic frame, we have an exchange rate, and the exchange rate is understood as an asset price. And in the money view, we emphasize that that li liquid prices, assets that are, are traded in liquid markets, the liquidity comes from dealers. So the dealer system is key to understanding um, the exchange rates, um, what, supports, what supports them, and the central bank liquidity swaps um, uh, which backstop the FX swap market. This is a dealer of last resort activity in in the foreign uh, exchange markets. Um, we've, I think, I always assign um, uh, 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 BIS stuff there about the bounds around covered interest parity. Okay, but um, I'm not going to really get into that uh, today. I'm just I'm putting little markers there so that you can see. Um, when if you think of the dollar as the as the global that this is a dollar system, um, a, a unified a money market globally, a unified capital market globally, and these are dollar markets globally, okay, then it follows really that US monetary policy is global monetary policy, okay, that um, other central banks, which have monetary policy, um, aren't really controlling the level of, of global interest rates, but just the spread between their domestic interest rate and, uh, and, and this is Charlie's view, by the way, I, this is not me inventing this, he said this many times a long time ago, so I think he was quite prescient, um, as Jay was, was saying, this, I think this is more true today than it was when he was speaking. And I, the last little bullet point there that I want to draw attention to is his emphasis on that that uh, uh, Jay was saying that in the money view you think of the world as a as a set of interlocking balance sheets, um, money money flow, and every entity is a money inflow in outflow system. The short term inter, the short term capital flows are like correspondent banking balance. Balances, but what's really important to him was the long-term capital flows, okay? Because that's about economic development, and the big challenge for him was was funneling money from the, the developed north to the undeveloped south, um, and for that, that's what the infrastructure, the global infrastructure of the money and finance system, is challenged to do, okay? In order to create dynamic world growth, um, he was a, a student of of Hansen, who who had this secular stagnation idea. And so he thought the way to get out of secular stagnation is to develop the global south. Um, and uh, so that's that that is one of the newest things that has been happening since the global financial crisis is that's turned out the global south is able to tap global capital markets. And that's what's being tested right now as we're in a tightening cycle of U.S. monetary policy. Um, so uh, I'm not going to talk much about that today, but that's the context in which we're having this conversation right now. Okay, that we've had 10 years of elasticity of really quite remarkable long-term capital flows in dollars to the global south um, that is now being uh, tested. So what I want to, so now why is that sort of, a, I want to I contrast this view, this key currency view with the standard approach. So in the left-hand column, there's three slides here. Um, this, the, the sort of bring up to consciousness what you probably learned, um, what I learned um, in the cl in class. Um, and uh, this is the first time I'm giving this as a public uh, as a public talk. So this is subject to revision. but but here's my attempt to say what is 
you know, what do most people believe <laughs> um, without thinking of it, that, that they even think like, well, this is obvious and we don't have to discuss it. You know, they think of that, that uh, Jay mentioned this, that, that Bretton Woods is the key moment, okay? That that's when the international monetary system was established by a treaty, by these finance ministers sitting and signing a document. And so the international monetary system was established by a treaty. This was a, a multilateral treaty following the Westphalian political logic. Every country, you know, was signing this, this treaty. Um, and um, the treaty was establishing the international monetary system and, and the dollar was put in a special place. And the dollar that is thought of, you know, is, is you know, these are the U.S. finance ministers there. There were no bankers at, 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 at Bretton Woods by design. Um, so it's the it's the liability of the Central Bank of the United States, um, the Fed, which is the, the, the international reserve currency. Um, and that dollar is is really a domestic dollar, the public, it's, I mean, the, the sphere of influence of the United States uh, government um, is stops at the border. So, so that those dollars, other people have to get access to somehow. There is this image also that, er, that comes from the Westphalian political logic that is, that is put on the international monetary system that there's this triple coincidence that the BIS has criticized, um, that every nation is an island um, and, and maybe that the U.S. has exorbitant privilege in being placed in a special case, the issue of the reserve currency. So this is the sort of stuff you hear in standard dialogue. And what I'm contrasting that with is the, let me just, I got to make room here so I can see. Yeah. Um, Charlie emphasized that the international monetary system emerges from business practice, um, that the the emergence of a, of a single currency as the international currency comes from economic logic of, of the efficiency, just as the, 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 the logic uh, why it's a good idea to have a single currency within a country, you know, the the joining of all of the parts of the U.S. monetary system into into a, an integrated system, which happened with the Fed in 1913. That logic is the same logic that applies internationally. The political logic is tougher, you know, but the economic logic is is the same. Um, offshore, of course, offshore dollar private is a private dollar. It's going to be the liability of 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 private banks it's the private dollar that is the key here um they issued by banks as the international reserve currency the offshore euro dollar um i emphasized before thinking of the world not as islands but that there's a single money in capital market and that market is a dollar market um and the uh it's instead of the us sort of being a privileged it's a leader and it's it's providing a public good that is for as a global public good. Um, and um, that's a little, that becomes a little sort of politically difficult, um, the exorbitant burden um, aspect uh, of it. So this is a revisionist frame and that leads to a kind of revisionist history. So down the left-hand column, again, I'm telling the history of the rise of the, of the international monetary system, its various vicissitudes, um, thinking that it started in 1944 with Bretton Woods, um, the dollar's connected to gold, everyone else is connected to the dollar. Um, the point of the IMF was to restore multilateral trade. This wasn't about capital flows really at all. Um, the US um, often is accused of hijacking the IMF role, which was supposed to be a kind of global central bank um, and, uh, and relegating it to uh, also ran status um, uh, uh, operating with developing nations, so often 1971 is referred to as the collapse of Bretton Woods um, because of its internal contradictions, like that Triffin maybe pointed out. And the uh, in 1979, um, Volcker is 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 given credit for whipping domestic U.S. inflation. Um, that's that's his his role. Um, and the Plaza Accord maybe restores Bretton Woods multilateralism. This is a sort of standard. Uh, economic historians tell stories like this too. Whereas Charlie always told a story that started with the 1933 World Economic Conference and, and John H. Williams attempting to get agreement to stabilize the pound sterling against the dollar as you're moving from a sterling system to a dollar system that was torpedoed by the politicians um, started up again from the New York Fed in 1936, the tripartite agreement to stabilize pound and, against the dollar. And, and the French franc was included then too. That also kind of disappeared because of World War II, you know, all uh, currency controls were put in place. But it's that sort of emergent, emergent uh, from the banking world, okay, uh, uh, system that sort of the, 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 um, 
Bretton Woods blessed in 1944. So it wasn't created in 1944. It, it was blessed um, in, in his understanding. Um, and, the, and the important thing that is happening um, in the world are, are capital flows, the resurgence of capital flows um, after being shut down in depression and also in, in world war. Um, the BIS already existed um, and was an agent for short-term capital flows in the return of the of Europe to convertibility in 1958, and then later on with the dollar swap lines. Um, and uh, so that was the central institution for him, not the IMF. Um, and the World Bank was a central institution of Bretton Woods because it was a way of getting long-term capital flows going again. Um, it was the U.S. that took the lead after the after war, uh, after the war, um, with the Anglo-American loan and then the Marshall Plan. Um, and this is as it should be. This is the key currency idea. Um, in that regard, <laughs> Nixon's crime of 1971. 71 is not the collapse of Bretton Woods, but but the destruction of Bretton Woods, uh, willful destruction by by the politicians by Nixon. Um, uh, wanting to throw off the exorbitant burden of, of leadership. Um, and uh, that's what Volcker uh, restored in 1979. That's just a typo there, 71. Obviously, it's 1979. Um, I hadn't noticed that when I reviewed my slides. Um, and, uh, and so what Plaza restores is not multilateralism, but rest of the world followership. So, so the whole, the, this sort of um, uh, evolution of the international monetary system, this story is a different one than the standard one. And it's a revisionist economic theory too. Instead of Triffin and Harry Johnson, the monetary approach, the balance of payments, the new international economic order, Mundell, these are the sort of uh, touchstones of the standard story. It's Williams, it's Willis, um, it's, it's hierarchy um, and US monetary policy, world monetary policy. I'm not gonna talk too much about economic theory um, now maybe that's for next year. Um, uh, mostly, it's the it's the it's the second slide, the, the history slide that we're going to be pursuing. And the question is, why is the uh, key currency a minority view? Um, there's the link to the paper that I mentioned that I gave in 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 Rome at this conference that that Christina had organized. Um, and I, I propose in that paper um, that there are three things that um, get in the way of, of people taking on this key currency uh, approach. Um, one is a kind of, is what I call the fetish of the real, um, that uh, people don't, they, they wanna think about uh, trade of real goods, okay? And not think about the monetary infrastructure that makes that possible. In fact, they view all of that as some kind of a veil. You need to look through the veil to see the real stuff underneath. Whereas, of course, a money view tends to see this interlocking structure of balance sheets as actually the fabric of, of, the, of the market economy internationally as well as domestically. So this fetish of the real comes from sort of civil society too. It's not particularly an economist view. And the same is true with the second one, the fetish of sovereignty, the Westphalian myth, you know, the, the notion that my country is, is just as good as your country and all countries are equal. Um, and uh, so we can't see these global these these global forces, um, or rather, we want not to see them. Okay, because we want to believe uh, things that that maybe are not are not true, or or uh, and uh, and so that's that gets in our way. Um, and then third, what I call in the paper the bogeyman of banking which is sort of the agency of credit creation, the way that banks can, by expanding their balance sheets on both sides, um, uh, provide credit, a new credit um, to uh, governments, um, to business. And so both business and governments are a little anxious about that, okay? Uh, that, that banks, they see their, their projects seem to be dependent on convincing bankers to finance them. Um, and that anxiety, uh, which is a sort of, you know, contested terrain sort of idea, um, it, in order to put, to keep that anxiety away from us, you know, we can abstract from the agency of credit creation. And so that that's a reason it's these cycle, these are sort of psychological uh, 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 obstacles to adopting the international, the, the key currency version of the money view. Um, 
I said these are these are obstacles of ordinary citizens of you know of my students, for example. Um, and so I a lot of my job in teaching, I noticed these and I, I th that's what's brought them up to consciousness for me. And so I have to develop ways of overcoming them or making the students aware that there are other ways of thinking that might that they might confront these these psychological challenges um, in order to understand money and that the payoff will be that they are actually understanding the real world instead of living in a in a fantasy. Um, so those are the the lay views, but these 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 same two fetishes and one bogeyman, I believe, um, have entered economics. Um, in, in, and in particular, in the particular formalization that was chosen um, in the, in the post-World War II period, um, a formalization which abstracted from money um, and therefore also kind of international money. Um, and I take Han to be one of my informants on this, You know, where he was early realizing that the ISLM formulation Formalization, um, in particular, 1965. He's 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 um, a critic of Patinkin, um, as a matter of fact. But the, so monetary Valrasianism, this this tendency that that rose up, um, and uh, he's a critic of that, and he's a critic again of sort of a general equilibrium, Arrow de Brua, um, which is sort of the foundation of the DSGE model, um, saying it just has no room for money, and yet. This is the, the this is the workhorse. This is the the, uh, the high theory um, accepted sort of universally. Um, so what do you do if you have a theory like that and you're trying to give advice to central bankers? You add friction. So that's what Smet and Bowders does at the high level. And um, the talk that Gita Gopinath gave just just uh, in January at the American in American. Uh, uh, Social Science Association, um, her lunchtime talk, the the AEA and AFA. Um, I urge everyone to have a look at that. This is an attempt to say, well, we can take the Mundell Fleming model, okay, and add financial frictions in order to make it more connected to the real world. Um, I see all of this, by the way, as a positive step um, because the be, being required to put these financial frictions in. It means you're trying you to connect to the real world. Well, those are the things that you know the 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 LPFMI is view, viewing as constitutional. You know, these are these are the foundations of our system. So it's a little gestalt switch, maybe, that we're trying to do here um, to to say um, I want to study those frictions rather than get rid of them. Okay, the, the by viewing them as frictions, you imagine that there's a possible world in which there are no frictions, in which, in other words, there's no money. There's so, and that, of course, uh, I think the money view uh, tells you that is an impossible world, um, and so that idealization tends to lead you to think, you know, that the price of liquidity should be zero, um, and 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 that distorts monetary policy. So we, we there there is something for the money view to do here um, in terms of regulation, in terms of monetary policy. That's an agenda for the future. I'm just here saying what what the kind of intellectual obstacles are um, that are in standard economics. The we didn't. It, why do why did it grow that way? It didn't have to be that way. Um, in 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 1932, this is a quote from Hawtrey. Um, there's the origins of the current key currency approach are exactly in this period, and there was monetary optimism. Central bankers thought that if we could just cooperate, we can solve this depression problem. Um, and and this is his emphasis. We can ensure an expansion taking place. Okay, this is this is 1932. He's writing in the Art of Central banker, which Alex was saying now, now a bunch of you have, have read. Um, this was the attitude of central bankers when they came to the 1933 World Economic Conference. They were trying to organize this, okay, but the politicians stopped them, okay. The monetary optimism of the central bankers was halted, um, and it never got started again, okay, and economics got built on other foundations, starting with Marshak in 1938, Money in the Theory of Assets, uh, Modigliani, 1944, this is his version of ISLM. Hicks did something earlier. Um, Patinkin, as I said, was the target of, of, of Hahn's critique. Um, Tobin, 1969, a general equilibrium approach to, the, to monetary theory. Um, and then Woodford, this is sort of the new Keynesian DSGE. Uh, so this is the evolution. It's all monetary Valrasianism. And you can see what happened. <laughs> it started with money and the theory of assets, and it moved 
money got pushed out of the picture entirely. Finally, in Woodford, it's not money interest in prices, which it was with Vixel, it's just interest in prices. Um, and uh, that's the logic of the of the of Aero de Brua at, at work there. Um, and so now, why is the key? So now I'm coming to my um, the conclusion that I started with, um, and then I have three more slides. Why is the key currency approach difficult? Instead of saying why is it the minority approach, I'm now asking why it's difficult. So these three, these four things on the left are what I've I've come to believe is why the money view is difficult. And so these are things that, as we're learning the money view, we have to confront um, and become comfortable with this: the alchemical quality of the swap of IOUs, um, the kind of inherent hierarchy of all of this. Um, what Alex was also talking about: sub subsidiarity, the uh, inherent hybridity public and private um that there's that that this all the systems seem to to be and we're and that pol policing that boundary between public and private um rather than trying to eliminate the private or eliminate the public um and wow. uh and instability that it, that is inherent and Hawtrey said in that same book art of central banking he spoke of the inherent instability of credit this is something all central bankers believe but is not in any economic models really or not this not the the, the most predominant ones and and it needs to be it, that's the whole reason for central banks so you need you need to have that center center piece and and now i've come to believe this is an advanced since Rome, okay, that these four things map on to the, 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 the two fetishes and the bogeyman, you know, that the fetish of the real is really the international version of, of, of alchemy. Fetish of sovereignty is, is the international version of, of, of hybridity. Um, the bogeyman of banking, this is the, the anxiety of, about, about um, expansion of credit um, it is it pl plays out uh, in the international world, um, and it's a, and it's an anxiety about hierarchy because that of course means that the United States is uh, the dollar is is above others. Um, it's a it's a it's an it's an anxiety about instability, and there's therefore a tendency to say if only we could get rid of credit we wouldn't have hierarchy. If only we could get rid of credit we wouldn't have instability. Wouldn't that be a great world? This of course prevents you from understanding the world as it is. Uh, that credit is a feature, not a bug, okay? It's, it's a feature with some problematic aspects, okay? So it needs management, as 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 Badgett always said. Um, and that's the challenge. The challenge is management, okay? Not uh, elimination of, of credit um, and its elasticity. So here, I've just said... Uh, you know why? Why is it a minority view? Now here I'm going to just say at the end, remind you why it shouldn't be a minority view. Okay, and it shouldn't be a minority view because it's correct. Okay, because this this is the this is a, a an image from Ito and Macaulay showing the kind of the expansion of the dollar payment system um, from 68 to 85 to 2001 to 2017, um, through visit, vicissitudes, through crises, expansion sort of the first project after World War I was, was you know, uniting the, the United States dollar system, domestic dollar system with the European uh, uh, system. Um, and that's really what Charlie was, that was his period, okay. but. So Subsequently, um, Asia expansion of the dollar system integrating with Asia, and now since since um, the financial crisis, um, the global South, as I as I mentioned. So we we see in the long sweep of history um, that uh, the dollar system is expanding geographically. Um, the uh, emerging dollar funding system might take this from from the BIS other BIS authors Aldosorio and Ehlers, um, showing how this expansion since since the global financial crisis in the global south um, has been funded through this offshore funding system of 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 Japanese um, financial intermediaries um, getting term dollar funding from Europe and Europe getting overnight funding and and the this this money market funding of capital market lending this is this is shadow banking, um, but it's shadow banking that is spread across the global uh, offshore dollar uh, intermediary system um, and is uh, is backstopped by 
in 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 good times um, foreign exchange swap hedges because of course uh, Japan's natural funding is in yen. Okay, so FX swaps um, allow them to uh, manage that currency exposure mismatch. Um, and similarly, European natural funding sources are in euro are in euros, and so the FX swap are are there to manage that currency exposure, and that involves somebody taking currency exposure and uh, and a backstop. And so here is the backstop. This is the this. Um, uh, working paper that I that it's now actually just been published um, as a matter of fact um, and uh, in in a, in a in a history history journal uh, annual um, trying to give you an image of the backstop that that in 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 overnight term markets and 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 capital markets um, the Fed operates that's what the gray areas are they're the shaded areas the Fed operates as the backstop in all three of these areas. That's what we saw in the global financial crisis, um, um, if need be. Okay, um, in the in, in the sort of core of the system, it's not really backstopping the capital markets, but it is backstopping uh, money markets and overnight payments. And in the global south, through this new FEMA repo facility, um, there are uh, there's an emerging uh, backstop there. Um, I titled this slide, and yet it moves um, for Galileo because I gave. A version of this talk in Rome at the Academy de Lensee, which is where Galileo was. So I felt myself to be standing on the shoulder of giants, um, meaning, yes, it's a, it's a global dollar system. The key currency approach um, actually kind of tells you how the world works. Um, and yet it remains a minority approach. Isn't that a puzzle? So that's that. Well, thank you, Perry, for this great presentation. Um, I dare say those of you who are not familiar with these concepts might be overwhelmed and puzzled by, by this perspective. But may I just add, it all starts with, with, with payments and having a payments perspective, which informs uh, everything else. Other, other perspectives are abstracting from this essential feature um, and, and therefore um, have moved away completely from uh, understanding this intermediation process that is actually underway in the world economy. But I don't want to be the discussant for this. Uh, we have two excellent discussants. Um, allow me to uh, bring to the stage Prof Professor Makutso. Hello. Uh, first of all, let me say from the outset how delighted I am to have been asked to comment um, Paris uh, <clears throat> talk, which, as he said, is based on a paper which I had the fortune to discuss uh, the Lynche uh, conference. So my comments here are basically related to, to that kind of uh, approach that he presented, and it is uh, now being published in his working paper by, by INET. So I will concentrate on the many things that he has said on just a few points um, and uh, to raise a couple of questions uh, just to get the ball rolling. So let me start with this key currency approach and what this key currency approach is challenging. And as, as Perry has made sufficiently clear, the challenge is the, to the idea that the monetary system is an arrangement something that has been agreed like a contract among different states and it is operated as if it were a, a genuine uh, international organization. By contrast, what the key currency idea is, is that we have to think of the international um, uh, payment system or international monetary system as an extension as an extension of a country's domestic payment beyond its territorial or legal boundary, okay? Uh, and this extension implies an hierarchy, namely um, the, when the, the monetary system is extending beyond national uh, borders, there is an apex, there is a sort of hierarchy uh, and uh, the, the national currency takes over the role of the international key currency. And all the others, monetary jurisdiction, 
they are pushed in a peripheral position. So um, since uh, Perry's book uh, is a reminder of the Checo book, Manian Empire, we have here the same idea of a core and a periphery, a center and, and a periphery. And of course, the, the apex in this hierarchical position uh, represent the financial center in which the uh, clearing of all payments uh, take place. And of course, the, uh, the uh, area highest institution in the international paying system uh, is the apex central banks. Okay, so th this is not a summary, but this is just to point out what is the, to my understanding, is the important point about the key currency and how it changes the way in which we see also the evolution, the historical evolution of monetary system and the story that we've been told and that we've been teaching about the evolution of international monetary system. Now, uh, the frame that Perry has, has decided to, to give to, to this understanding is to a question. Why, why this key currency approach is not generally accepted? Why is it a minority view? And you've seen that he has given three answers uh, with the, the fetish and the bogeyman. And uh, let me just uh, summarize what his answer are is first is the uh, centrality of settlement in the payment system and the centrality of market making for the determination of prices. This market making is not something that we see, uh, is not something that uh, uh, we see even less when it is extending to international scene. Mm. Okay? So it's the, the, the market making in the determination of prices that is not immediately visible and then poses an obstacle in the understanding of, of the situation. Then there is the fetish of sovereignty, the idea that uh, you know, we, have very, we have difficulty uh, to go beyond uh, our idea that uh, uh, social life is organized within nation states. And this of course is another obstacle in understanding how really the uh, international monetary system work and then the bogeyman of, of banking and uh, the idea that most economies, most economic theory is based on the concept of an intermediation between saving and investment rather than understanding that credit creation is, is, is the core business in the system. So uh, I have three questions, which are very similar to the one I raised in, uh, in commenting uh, um, the Lin Che paper, but I think that they might be worth repeating it. First question, what are the consequences uh, in terms of monetary policy of having the wrong theory, namely not being able to base uh, monetary policy uh, action on, on, on key currency rather than on standard theory. And I comment there and I repeat now what uh, reminding what Charles Goodhart uh, reminded us many years ago. Central banks do not care what economists say anyway. They have their own way of addressing the problem. So what, what is really lost? in terms of monetary policy action by not having the currency, the key currency view approach? This is my first question. Um, the second question is that Perry puts a lot of emphasis on the idea that laymen and economists do not understand money because they don't understand credit, okay? And, um, they don't understand something that we find sometimes difficult to teach our students, that uh, money requires only the willingness of the public to enter into a debt contract with the banking system. It's nothing beyond that. Uh, why, uh, why is it something that is so difficult to understand? Why, um, and I don't see very clearly why this is linked 
to the difficulty of accepting the key currency view. I, I see it as a difficulty in understanding how money enters in the economic system. And this is perfectly true in the variation, general equilibrium and so on. But I'm not clear what is the relationship between this, not being able to understand money as a credit to the uh, key currency views approach. My third and final question is the question is, is something to do with the idea of money as a veil. And the idea of money as a veil is certainly a long tradition in the history of economic thought. And what I argue, and I think Perry uh, will agree, is a very bad metaphor. Why is it a bad metaphor? Because it implies that the unveiling, uh, the unveiling, namely take the money away, uh, would uh, reveal the real forces in the economy. Okay, so that's that's certainly true that this veil unveiling business is misleading. But in the money view, is there any room left for the real forces operating? at the level of prices. And in other words, my question is that, is whether in the money view, we still have room for real forces in determining prices and so forth. What is the link and so forth. And finally, let me, let me comment um, that as, uh, as uh, Perry said about the Kindlebergen, but he said the same about Minsky in a paper I was given to read and I think he gave it at the ASA meeting, that they both have this institutionalism, uh, pre-war American institutionalism background. And uh, I think that uh, the minority view is due to, the, to a missing thread. And the missing thread is the institutionalist thread that was lost in the macroeconomic development and so together with Keynes approach that was swapped into the ISLM, I think that the institutionalist approach, the institutional idea were lost. And this is one of the reason why perhaps the, uh, the view became a minority view. Thank you very much. That's what I have to say. Thank you, Professor. Those were excellent comments. Uh, we'll welcome to the stage, Professor. Vazudevan. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's a real honor to be a discussant at this really exciting presentation. Now, um, uh, Perry raises a really important question about why, despite its explanatory power, the key currency view remains marginalized in the, uh, and a minority view in the academic circles of economists. Now, this question is not just one of academic curiosity, but is, is more pressing, I think, especially now when the geopolitical fallout of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the resurgence of global monetary, uh, global inflationary pressures, and the re consequent recalibration recal of central bank policies from loose to tight, and it's really the prospect of debt crisis in the global south in a context where global asset management funds and Chinese banks have increased the footprint in sovereign debt markets. All of this is testing the global dollar system. Um, now, the key currency approach, as has been said, is an extension projection of the money view onto the international arena. And the core of this is, of course, understanding of banking as a payment system, settlement system, and market making system. With the balance of payments, the international analog of the survival constraint uh, requiring settlement in international money, today the global dollar. And with central banks, I mean, with uh, global banks and funds and foreign exchange dealers on one hand, and central banks and the network of central bank swap lines uh, playing a critical role in, in the mechanisms of settlement and market making. Now, um, uh, Perry, when raising the question of the marginalization of the key currency approach and the need to understand why as a prerequisite for any future project or remedy, he points to the three features that have confounded the theorization of money, the two fetishes and the bogeyman, the fetish of the real, the fetish of sovereignty and the bogeyman of banking. Now, these features also reflect longstanding debates and fault lines in the history of economic thought and monetary theory. 
I mean, between currency school and banking school, monetarists and Keynesians on one hand, and between chartless and nominalists, the claim theory of money and the commodity theory of money on the other. And at the heart of this is also the difficulties which he kind of pointed to in this talk and uh, about the alchemy, hierarchy, hybridity, and instability. But at the heart of the difficulty is the dichotomies which theory has imposed between real and financial, nation state and global economy, public money and private money. And um, I think rather than as dichotomy, we need to think of the contested gray zones where the interplay between real and financial, nation state and global economy, public debt and private finance, states and markets, all of that unfolds. And this requires a more dialectical approach, one that straddles, encompasses these contradictions. Now, Kindleberger, as uh, Ferry has shown in his book uh, and his talk, uh, used comparative political economy as a lens and the lens of a historical economist to explore and illuminate this gray terrain. And grounding his analytical approach and pragmatism and a deep in and dialectical engagement with concrete institutional context, the institutional uh, uh, historical roots of his analysis. And so he could argue both that states propose and markets dispose, and also that if markets don't work, don't use markets. He could see the paradox in the econo that in economics, the worldwide is efficient, in social questions, small is beautiful. Now, Perry has very ably shown that um, Kindleberger's vision embraced the underlying tendency of the system towards expansion and integration, but through a choppy seesaw mechanism. And how both wars and crisis led to renegotiation of the boundaries between public and private money, between political and economic dimensions of the cross-border flows. And thus it paves, paves a path for new expansions, but through this dialectic of fragility and resilience. And in this, a key role is played by central banks as lenders of last resort, but extending this logic to the international terrain is more complicated. Now, for one, as um, Lance Taylor has shown, uh, among others, has argued, the in, a, in a stock flow consistent macro model, the balance of payment is not an independent equation that can be added on to the ISLM model, a la Mandel Fleming. So there's an additional degree of freedom and therefore a need for separate de determination of exchange ra uh, rates and reserve holdings, which gives you the room for the balance payment as a survival constraint and the whole role of market making and settlement. Second, playing the role of international lender of last resort is more difficult and less dependable than that of the uh, lender of last resort domestically with the caveat that the presence or absence of an international lender of last resort conditions and circumscribes the scope for domestic lender of last resort action, especially for emerging markets. So in the international sphere, the tent to the tension of calibrating elasticity and discipline in the mechanisms of liquidity creation, there is the tension of balancing hierarchy and pluralism in the international monetary system. And um, this fraught process of forging a consensus between followers and leaders, which is necessary for the smooth operation of the international monetary system, is propelled by both states and markets, by political authority and economic power. The present system is an outcome of what uh, Aline Grable had labeled productive incoherence in an analysis which is closely aligned with the framework of Albert Hirschman, whose conception of unbalanced growth has a close affinity to the key currency approach too. But in all this, one mustn't lose sight of the fact that the externalities inherent in the provision of the public good of international liquidity are open to the twin perils of predation and parasitism. So the hierarchy of the international monetary system both reflects and shapes a geopolitical ordering across the dominant hubs of the network of global finance. So how can the key currency approach help navigate these choppy waters and emerge from the margins to kind of take center stage in analysis? Now, Perry raises an important point about the need to engage with the older literature and De Decheco's Money Empire being a case in point 
which grew from the experience of the financial globalization of the Sterling system, a period. And this, as he says, is the underutilized resource. And I would stress here that um, to, the, to the revisiting of the history of the dollar, uh, which Perry has done, we need to, there are also analytical insights that can be gained by looking at the contemporary market-based uh, finance and shadow banking system with its dominant hub in the, in, in, uh, I mean, with its dominant hubs through the lens of the financial revolution centered around the city of London and sterling bills in the 19th century. Or else by tracing parallels and discontinuity between the functioning and mechanisms of the de facto sterling standard before the world war of World War One, and the modern global dollar system, or investigating how financial subordination of colonies under the gold exchange standard prefigured the financial subordination through the imperatives of reserve accumulation in the recent period. A reserve accumulation and cap and and hot cap, I mean, and hot money in the recent period. So these regularities and patterns we see in history are the concrete basis for building and fleshing out a coherent analytical framework for the present moment. Um, now, um, Perry in his book has also shown how, how the key currency uh, uh, approach traces this analytical lineage, uh, not just to Minsky whose focus was more national, but who stressed the interlocking balance sheets and survival constraints, which are so key to this analysis, but also to older ideas in the history of economic thought, classical economists, Fisher, Wicksell, et cetera. What I would argue is that what's missing in this is, is Marx. And there is a fruitful avenue of research which would trace the analytical line from Marx to Minsky to the money view and the key currency approach. Um, Marx's logical historical elaboration of the unfolding functions of the forms of money is supple enough to embrace the real financial, public, private, sovereign, global dialectics of world money, and also embrace the interplay of political authority and economic power in the mechanisms of international liquidity cre creation. And the theoretical framework developed through his Marx's method of moving from abstract to successively more concrete layers of determination places money right at the center of the analysis. And instead of simply adding on an equation of money demand supply onto a real model of exchange or extrapolating the same micro foundational methodological principles that apply to households and firms to the theorization of money in the monetary Walrasian models or in the DSG models, where you add the equation and, and sprinkle some frictions to deal with real world complications. And so there's a viable and robust alternative to Walrasian DSG kind of frameworks whose adoption has been, as Perry argues, instrumental to the marginalization of the key currency approach. The, and finally, the third factor which Perry has highlighted is the waning of monetary optimism uh, during depression. But in this context, we can see that in contrast to the fumbling and misguided central bank interventions during the interwar period, the, the unprecedented, unconventional central bank response the, with the US Fed at the helm uh, uh, to the global financial crisis was remarkably effective. So in the wake of this demonstration of central bank power and maybe more optimism about the scope for monetary policy, we saw the emergence on one hand of the political project of the MMT, which embraces this capacity of the state to create money and seeks to harness it to progressive national agendas of employment guarantee, new Green New Deal. And on the other, the libertarian espousal of private cryptocurrency as a kind of a bulwark against the unbridled despotism of the Fed, Federal Reserve. But both the status reforms that aim to expand the discretionary power of the state to ad address democratic priorities of, uh, and the libertarian experiments, which kind of uh, seek an alternative to private in private currencies, they miss that critical contested gray zone of the volatile interplay of market forces and state power, public and private money, national and global, which is the root of global money. And I would argue that, that um, um, 
this actually the time is actually ripe for recovering an alternative coherent theoretical framework embedded in the key currency approach, but one that is informed by the financial history of capitalism, in particular the 19th century, one that digs further beyond Minsky, drawing on Marx, and one that directly addresses and engages with the contradictions between the domestic political institutions and the global nature of capital, because that is where all the complications and the, and the possibilities lie. So I don't really have questions, these are more like comments which are kind of uh, pushing the discussion further. So thank you. Thank you for these excellent discussions. Um, I think we have a lot of ground to cover even now. Um, but first of all, let's hand over to Perry before we uh, get into uh, questions from the rest of the audience. Perry. Um, well, let me um, thank the discussants for their uh, remarks, and um, which I take in a constructive spirit. Um, and I think they were meant in a constructive spirit. Um, and I will observe. Uh, um, Christina has three questions, but her I want to her fourth one is saying, well, this money view thing that is treating money as the realest thing there is, um, where do where do the actual where do other material forces enter into there? Can you and and I would say I I think that 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 the answer to that is sort of what Rama said, you know, that the that the money view um, framework is supple enough. I like that word supple enough to uh, to be extended. Um, and uh, that hasn't that hasn't happened yet. That's a project for the future um, where you think that where the cash inflows and outflows for individual agents are coming from is their productive activity. You know, so that uh, and and of course a a business that is profitable. Okay, that means that their cash inflows are greater than their cash outflows. So they're a surplus. They're a structurally surplus agent, which is a very a very advantageous thing to be. Okay, and you can understand that from a money view perspective. So I think that the problem of extending the money view to incorporate. Um, uh, re the real um, is 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 overcomable, um, and that, the, that there's no there's no contradiction um, there. Um, but it 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 needs to be done. That's a project. Similarly, Rama says, you know, really, you know, what what Charlie was was particularly great about, particularly in the toward the end of his life, was going beyond the econ economics and bringing in the politics, you know, and 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 being he he reminded us all the time that. Um, Things that happen to uh, uh, that the same shock in different uh, economies can have completely different effects. Okay, because of the institutional structure, because of the political structure. Um, so here again, I think this is something that the money view is supple enough to bring in, and maybe it's the next, maybe it's the next frontier. Okay, as it was for really Charlie's late in life work. Um, he he titled his uh, retrospective, um, the very last book he ever published, which is a collection of articles. He he published he he, he titled it. Um, uh, you know, compared to political economy, he just he thought he was a that he changed. He was an economic historian. He was an international economist. At the end of his life, he thought he was a comparative political economist. So, this is a this is the evolution that that uh, that and and I think that's that's what maybe we need to do too. I'm very happy that later on in the program we're getting some political commentary. I think that it's possible. I do believe because the print the 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 accounting framework, the the conceptual framework of the money view is so sort of primitive and foundational that it doesn't constrain you from from it doesn't mean you have to ignore real things. It doesn't mean you have to ignore political things. It just gives you the frame with in which to engage them. Okay, so that's my big overall comment about both discussants. Um, I won't say that I've done that. I won't say that I've done that adequately. I have not, okay. um, and that's a project for uh for other people um let me say maybe just one or two quick things though um because this is connected now to um Christina's first two questions why does it matter that economists just have no good idea about money why does it matter as long as central bankers know how the world works isn't that enough okay 
Well, I suppose we could ask if central bankers know how the world works, okay, all of them, all the time, particularly with the with the infusion of all of these research departments full of DESGE trained economists, okay, but let us grant that maybe central bankers actually know what they're doing. Maybe Powell actually is a key currency money view person in his bones. Um, I doubt that he is sort of uh, taking on board all the analytical framework because and unless I, unless he took the MOOC, I don't know. Um, but the, uh, but but he may feel it in his bones, and that's how central bankers always have in throughout history. You know, through experience, you you develop knowledge, even if you can't necessarily articulate it in a way that you can teach to sophomores in college. You know, so uh, suppose they did know that that Montague Norman and Benjamin Strong, you know, and, and in fact John H. Williams was was a central banker. He was in the New York Fed. The problem is now one of communication. Okay that you're doing things that are influencing the world um, and the politicians, the policymakers have to be convinced at a certain point, you know, that, that this is worth doing. Okay. Or they will prevent you from doing this um, that, you know, Nixon will come in and, and, and torpedo, you know, the dollar system try to anyway. Um, and that creates a big challenge then for central bankers to keep the thing going, which they did. You know the 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 book by by Arthur Coombs. I think you read. Maybe you're reading that in your reading group. The the uh, uh, is 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 his Not story. Yet. Okay, so you will read that, and that that'll be very interesting uh, contrast. Um, so there are consequences, and there are and there are consequences for you know uh, for uh, a public discourse about this. As I as I as I sort of hinted at the end. Um, Using this financial friction stuff as the as the as the primary way that economists talk about 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 money builds in a a notion that these are these are imperfections. These are things that we should try to get rid of. You know that we should try to move as close as possible to Arrow de Brewer. That that's actually the goal. And and I think a money view framework says that shouldn't be the goal. You know, the that 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 in fact is going to mean, mean that you systematically underprice liquidity, okay, and that you're systematically therefore going to be blowing asset bubbles and creating instability, okay, instead of instead of manage. So so it, it creates problems for management to the extent that those models are built into are, are built into the con and 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 conversation. Um, so that's now the last thing I'll say is about her sec about Christina's second question which um, I don't think maybe I understood when she asked it in, in Rome. Um, so I, maybe I understand a little bit now. Okay, yes, it's right that people have, uh, our students have problems understanding that money is a form of credit, the highest form of credit, okay? And uh, maybe, so how does this, what's the consequence of that for key currency? Well, you would maybe, maybe it's the old, you know, exorbitant privilege problem, you know, that, that the French seem to believe that the United States was printing money and buying up all the assets in France, um, that this was an asset that is nobody's liability, right? That it is, it's not a form of credit, right? That it's an asset that's nobody's liability. It, it's costless to produce this thing. And so you just print the printing press and you throw those and you and you buy up all the French national national treasures. Um, and so, so politicians, you know, are are and so he, he was one of the voices that was trying to destroy the dollar system, for example, um, viewing what what Charlie viewed as international financial intermediation. Right, that that the United States is providing the the international reserves, and it's also lending long term to Europe. And so this is this is international intermediation in liquidity that is being provided by the New York bankers, um, and uh, and Europe didn't appreciate that. Okay, this is this is the French. Okay, and the United States didn't appreciate that. You know, tried to put all these understanding this as somehow uh, capital outflows or or creating creating uncertainty. So and so they tried to kill it, and the end result was was uh, was Nixon. So the 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 problem of not understanding money as a form of credit. Okay, is has international repercussions um, as well as just domestic. All three of these questions and all of the matters of Rama, I hope if you've written down 
down your your comments and both of you and it seems like you have could you please send them to me because i they they really merit much more reflection than i can do here i'm not a man used to you know speaking on my feet i'm not a debater <laughs> so uh, uh but i will think about them okay and i want to think about them so please please send them Great. Fantastic. Thank you. We have about uh, 20 minutes left in the session. Um, I think it's time for us uh, in the audience to get in, into, into the debate. Um, we have two options for you. You can raise your hand uh, or you can type your question. Uh, either way, maybe uh, turn on your camera when you're asking your question. Um, uh, I think, Chengbei, uh, you were the first one to raise your hand. We'll go with you first. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having uh, thank you for have, giving me the opportunity to uh, to uh, to speak here. Uh, in fact, I have some comments because I, I believe a lot of these uh, discussions are so profound. So let me let me uh, uh, have my comment here. So uh, I built my uh, uh, global macro uh, thinking process on three things. The first is uh, really the money view or broad money view. Uh, Second, and that's really on the monetary economics. The second is uh, on macroeconomics, which which I believe uh, my foundation for that is the post Keynesian approach. So from there, of course, you have Kaliskin approach, and uh, then the third, of course, is finance. I have been a Wall Street practitioner for 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 like uh, three decades. So the, 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 my comment really on this is uh, the key currency is a minority view. In in some way similar similar to the uh, for example post casing is like heterodox economics as opposed to orthodox, so I I'm just wondering on the research front because if you take the money and credit is endogenous in the production process, and from that in fact you can build a much strong, um, uh, it, it, you can extend to the financial field, for example, someone can relate back to, I did read uh, Professor Morning's uh, new Lombard Street book uh, quite a long time ago. It talked about how the US banking sector originated in a different way from the British banking sector, and which of course led to a lot of the uh, uh, debt related or the, uh, the church related functions. And of course, I'm just uh, thinking about uh, uh, that element. In addition, of course, there is a, a based on the U.S. unique uh, economic model. It opens up to a different balance payment structure, and uh, uh, so it, it, uh, there's really more comment because I, have, I potentially have so many questions. It's more comment at this point is if you combine the the money view, which is uh, a lot of people probably think about is about plumbing issue, but in fact, it's more than that. But if you combine that with the post casings views of the how, especially Kaleskin uh, type of approach uh, about how the credit and money uh, function. And of course, on top of that, you, you, you throw in a lot of the traditional, I mentioned the third element is the finance, right? Of course, it, when you have financial innovation, a lot of uh, you can change the market in, in some path dependent ways. So, so that's kind of a, really my comment, really the most important thing is post-casing type approach combined with money view type approach can open doors to a lot of exciting research. It's just like my thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll take two, two uh, comments, questions at the time. So my least, you were the next in line. Sure, thank you very much for, for giving me. Uh, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow in UPenn and I, I happen to teach the history of the social monetary system. So I found this discussion very uh, interesting. My first question is um, maybe to I'm asking you about the standard approach uh, of this, because when I teach the history of the international monetary system, I teach Michael Bordeaux, Harold Gent, Barry Aiken Green, Mark Flandro, and I'm, I'm quite surprised that I don't see them in a uh, discussion. And when I read your standard approach, it doesn't match from what I read from them. And they really are in line with Kindleberger and they cite him. So I, they, I really see a continuity between Kindleberger and this more recent economic history scholar of the international monetary system. So I wanted to ask you uh, if you have like a name or someone or what's a literature you're referring to when you're thinking of the standard approach? Because even, even the pure economist 
like Cedric Thiel or Linda Goldberg, when they do the vehicle currency discussion about the role of the dollar today, they have the same type of discussions uh, about the key currency uh, role of the dollar. So I was confused what the standard approach that make the key currency view a minority. And I guess I just want to throw in a, a small comment because I also happen to be a scholar of the French uh, economic history. And the goal, uh, I wouldn't say it tried to destroy the dollar system. I think it tried to save it, uh, the petrol system by asking the, the US to uh, deal with the uh, unbalanced uh, problem and the uh, um, balance of payment deficit. And I think Nixon didn't kill the dollar because the dollar remained the key currency uh, after 71. What he did is like he freed the dollar from the to me, at least from the fixed um, rate system. So yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to your answer. Great, thanks. Uh, over to you, Perry. Um, well, for the first one, um, I, I think probably uh, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that idea that this is another similar to Christina and Rama, uh, you know, that like, here's this here's this sort of supple thing. Can we add post-Keynesian? Can we, add, you know, where does it connect with finance? I think, yes. Remember, in terms of the, the, this, uh, you know, the, the emphasis on um, endogenous money, sure, the uh, credit is endogenous money. If you if you say that money money is a form of credit, it just follows. So that's, th this is a, in a way, a foundation on which you could you could build, and I think similarly for finance, finance tends to abstract from market making. Okay, but if you put the dealer function at the center, that's where you can connect with finance. Okay, where you uh, that and uh, and so my book on you know Fisher Black putting trainer model in the center there, that's a bridge between academic finance and Wall Street. Okay, um, as a, as a matter of fact, I don't know Shengbei if you if you know that book, but I think maybe you would you would you would enjoy it, um, and that's where I learned finance. So um, I felt I needed to learn finance before I could really, in order to build the money view uh, for them. That was the big challenge um, to me was Fisher Black, um, imagining a world without money. And I said, um, okay, where does money come in then with finance? So th that's, uh, but but you you say, Shanghai, that you're a Wall Street practitioner. When I say that the money, that that key currency is a minority view, I guess I mean sort of in in academia. Okay, um, that practitioners, just as central bankers, you know, have to deal with the real world. So, um, so Malus, economic historians. Um, well, economic historians deal with the real world. So, your your that that is a reason that you're finding this more uh, more congenial. And in fact, economic historians have taken my my Kindleberger book to heart. They love it. <laughs> and um, I mean, Harold James, you mentioned, you know, he he nominated for the best book of the year at Project Syndicate, you know, and Adam Tooze and and Michael Bordo has just asked me to come and give a talk in at Rutgers. So they're the economic historians absolutely uh are are on board, and perhaps they have always been on board. Okay. But that's that's again within the organization of economic thought, they're kind of on the periphery. Okay. That's uh maybe they shouldn't be on the periphery. Um, but certainly, Kindleberger felt himself to be on the periphery, and uh, because of because of that, and he found a home among the economic historians. These were people who who, who he felt he could he could talk to. Um, I will I will end. You mentioned um, vehicle currency literature. Um, you mentioned, and I mentioned Gita Gopinath, who for the dominant currency literature. You know, I I think what is happening in the last ten years is that there are inroads being made. In in standard economics, um, in various ways, different different little pieces. I have a slide on that in another in another uh, in another talk. Um, but uh, more inroads need to be made, and I think that all of the often these inroads are being made in kind of they're not they're not seeing that you know if you add all this stuff together, you need to do this gestalt switch that I referred to. Right? These aren't financial frictions anymore. These are financial foundations. Um, that is 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 unfinished business. Um, but I I do think, and I think maybe it's part of the MOOC that now there's like a million people who've taken the MOOC, which was ten years old. So that and they are now asking their professors questions, you know. And so I think I think it is sort of getting into the water a little bit more, um, and than it was ten years ago. Um, uh, ab absolutely, and that's that's all to the good. And and I I credit YSI <laughs> also. Thank you, Perry. We'll take all the credit for sure. Um, 
<laughs> the course anyway here to uh, to enjoy this. So we have uh, two questions coming right up. I think actually we'll take three questions right now. Uh, askers first. Um, Tinashe has a question in the chat. Um, maybe we'll start with that, Perry. I'll, I'll read it out. Is the dollar a key currency everywhere? And where is it being challenged? What is the view or money view towards it? I guess that's uh, that's maybe also something to be answered in the later panel. Um, then Asker and Alex, your questions. Yes, thank you. Fascinating this question to follow. Uh, I just want to fill in a little bit to see uh, the third question of uh, Christina Marcuso. Uh, I wanted to check if Perry uh, is in agreement and, and or if there is a difference between them, just to have it clarified for the audience that, that uh, the money as a whale as a bad idea or, or, or not, you know, just, just to put it in. Then on the, in a similar manner, on the last point, I think made by uh, uh, Rama uh, on, on uh, pushing Perry a little bit more, can you give us something uh, regarding the Minsky and Marx, uh, because I think you you skip that or, or, or we get that later. And I, I, and there I would like to hear maybe from both Perry and uh, Vastutrava, the, 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 the global nature of capital versus the global nature of money. This relates to the conceptual question yeah, that I've been struggling with for many years, you know, the difference of money and capital. So leave you with that, thanks. Yeah, so my question is, why is integrating the money view with the real side a project for someone else? Why doesn't it nag at you? How can you sleep at night knowing that this is unresolved? Well, Perry, what you got? <laughs> well, me. so um, the first one that you mentioned from the chat um, that uh, Yes, Zol Zoltan Pozar has uh, been a very vocal force, and probably you've seen this podcast I did, the so-called Great Debate on Bloomberg, um, and also I went I went to Credit Suisse in Zurich, um, and we had some conversations, um, and he was supposed to be here for this, and we were going to have that conversation. We're having that conversation anyway um, this afternoon um, from three to four um, about geo geostrategic so forth and I'll just maybe hint a little bit in the direction that's going um, I there there are attempts to get around the dollar system because of the sanctions um, on, on on Russia and the question is what do they amount to okay there are questions that there are attempts to get around the dollar system by countries that the private sector has has sanctioned them basically like Argentina okay we just saw in the FT uh, uh, yesterday, you know, about this Brazil, Argentina uh, uh, development, trying to develop a new currency, the sewer. Um, what do they amount to? What do they add up to? Okay, I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. So let me, I don't think they add up to a, any kind of sea change. Okay, let me just say that. And I'm looking at this in a historical perspective, that the dollar you know, grows by being challenged. That's what happens, you know, that the dollar's a goner and then it comes back from the ashes. So you need, we need to understand, well, why is that every time it's 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 and and Charlie himself thought it was a goner in 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 the in the seventies and yet it rose from the ashes so he was surprised by by that as well so I there's lessons there from history let me just leave it at that because we're going to talk it, about that some more um, Oscar yes I think money is a veil is a bad idea yeah um, and a, a bad metaphor is I think what Christina said um, obviously I I I sometimes say that money is the realest thing there is okay and that's in order to emphasize the survival constraint and to use the word survival, not settlement. So that's again to emphasize that this that this is a material thing, you know, that is enforceable by law and is is a very serious a very serious matter. Um, so yes, money as a veil is a bad idea. Um, Minsky and Marx. Um, well, you know, I so Rama emphasized that I didn't mention that Marx. You know, was very much. Uh, embedded in how how what are the institutions of capitalism how do they actually work 
Um, and he was a one of the things that I liked when I was reading Marx when I was younger is he has very good intellectual taste. He knows who's an idiot and who and who actually is and knows what they're talking about. And so on monetary matters, he's following the banking school. OK, and I don't know that he adds much to the banking school. OK, but I'm not an expert in volume two you know, of capital. But I read the banking school myself. I followed the banking school to and Fullerton. I was a period in my life that I did all of that. And so did and so did Marx. So and I so I. I think that's where you're going to find the 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 links to it's it's the banking school that that is 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 the is the key thread um i have nothing at all to say about the global nature of capital versus the global nature of money that's but um i would be surprised if you couldn't move in that direction why how can i sleep at night how can I sleep at night, Alex? Okay, um, because you have to crawl before you walk, before you run. And I decided 20 years ago that the reason that people weren't making progress on monetary economics was because they were too focused on the question of the price level, the fourth price of money. And that led them to not understand how money works. And so I said, let's just put that question to one side, okay? And let us start somewhere else, okay? And 15 years later, I had the MOOC, okay? With the other three prices of money, which I think we kind of understand pretty well now. So now that now it comes possible time to embrace this question of where is the connection to uh, the fourth price of money, um, which is a way of, of saying, let's let's integrate the monetary and the real, as it were. Um, and uh, and I'm trying to do that. You know, I'm sleeping at night, but I'm also maybe um, I'm I'm aware of of how long it takes to make intellectual progress. OK, and that it's a marathon, not a sprint, Alex. So you need to sleep. Because you need to get up tomorrow and work again. My wife keeps telling me that I need to sleep. Wisdom speaking here. Okay, we're at we're at the mark, but I think Karen has had her, her, her hand up. We'll take that question to close the session. Karen, go ahead. Thank you very much. I would like to um, return to the question of the balance of payments because I think there's some analysis to do in that respect, also with respect to the ordinary view of, of the money, uh, which also always stresses that all balance of payments will equalize. And this is not, as far as I know, the case because the private markets and the public markets are interfering in various ways, which makes this impossible because of the uh, nature of the different uh, capital flows and how they're registered in the official accounts. But this is a, one of the dogma that is really hampering discussion about uh, the economies because it's always stated that uh, if there's a deficit and uh, balance uh, trade deficit, then uh, then uh, there will be trouble, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that balance of payments constraints, even as they are, are not restrictive for the rich countries. They have easy access to money and uh, and sometimes they even get into problems if they don't have a balance of payment constraint because some of their actors are acting in ways which will challenge them. So um, I would like to hear your view on that, uh, Perry, and also if Rama would maybe uh, give a comment to that. You, you want me to speak now, Jane? Yeah. Uh, so. There's there's a lot of things here. I, I will just pick out one point, which is you you I, I believe I heard the word dark matter here. Okay, so the um, we're going to be talking a little bit about this dark matter thing um, in the in the session with Claudio Borio. I mean, a lot of the problem. I mean, in the in the money view. I am, I'm in general um, talking conceptually about the world, okay? The empirical counterparts of these concepts are, are maybe a, sometimes not easy to see because the accounting frameworks that we, we have um, have been have been not developed with the money view in mind. Okay, so you have the national income and product accounts, which we're trying to, you know, talk this in the next session really about going beyond 
going beyond them so that you can see some of this dark matter. Um, and particularly for the countries that are financially developed. So the, the global north, you know, the, the gross capital flows back and forth are just so enormous. And many of the countries in the global south really don't, don't have that access. And so the accounting structures that uh, are, are out of date um, and, and, prevent us, and prevent us from seeing um, some of the reality. Um, balance of payments don't equalize. You know, NEPA was created, at, you know, around Bretton Woods and the Marshall Plan with the idea that there were not going to be capital flows, right? That that we're trying to measure trade. What, what Bretton Woods was about was reestablishing multilateral trade, okay? Not capital flows, okay? And yet we have a world where capital it flows fungibly, you know, all all around, and 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 it's hard to understand how that world works if you're stuck in an accounting structure that was created for a world with where there were no capital markets, um, or rather, capital flowed through political channels, not through commercial channels. I'll just leave it at that. We're going to be coming back to um, some of these matters too in the in the in the afternoon session um, on on geopolitics. I think, yeah. Great. Rama and Christina, you can both have final comments as well in the session. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'll be brief. You're already over. So, uh, I mean, it's hard to kind of say something short and brief at the end of this fantastic session, but uh, I, I want to say two things. I mean, the thing with the balance of payment is, um, I mean, in terms of conventional frameworks and conventional model, it's, it's seen as uh, the natural counterpart of the ISLM Right, so when so you have you, you have equilibrium in three in three markets, but in even in an accounting state framework, when you have uh, stocks and flows, there's no independent balance of payment equilibrium condition, and that is what opens up the place for this the view of balance of payment as a settlement constraint for for the action of you know um, market makers and uh, dealers in the market for foreign exchange. And that is conceptually a lot more harder to pin down. And, um, and the distinction between gross and net flows becomes even more important when we think of it in, you know, in, uh, uh, within this approach, because we're talking about gross flows and gross flows have implications. And we're also talking about, um, um, I mean, the thing about the key, the key currency, there's a hierarchy but the hierarchy is not just a question of leaders and followers. There are different kinds of constraints imposed lower down the hierarchy, right? And those have to be, uh, and so which means the balance of payment constraint also operates differently uh, across the hierarchy. So there's a, I mean, it's, it's a maze nest, but it's, it's an exciting maze nest <laughs> to actually delve into. So uh, I'll just say that. I just want to say one thing about the veil metaphor. Um, I mean, the veil, the veil metaphor uh, originated by the attempt of the classical political economies to counteract the market, mercantilist idea that money was the only driving force in, in, in explaining prices. And certainly Hume and Adam Smith uh, add this idea that if you take the, the, the veil of money, you understand the structure of the price uh, determination. But that was not the case of Ricardo. And I want to, to, to raise the point, uh, um, Perry, that uh, uh, Ricardo was, cara, cara, was mi completely misunderstood by the currency school. And that's why you know we all feel that the banking school at the right position, just because we misinterpret what Ricardo had to say on monetary theory. And uh, so I would urge uh, students and, and people interested in, in the evolution of this idea of money as a veil and what has the real force in the economy to go back to Ricardo as a monetary theory, not as portrayed by the currency school. And I'm afraid also by Marx, who thought that Ricardo had the quantity theory and so on, and try to get the sense in which he was trying to develop a theory in, in which money has an important role to play as a standard of value, as a way to isolate fluctuation that derived from the real as opposed to the monetary sector. So this is my 
advice to, to people who are still interested in find out how this uh, metaphor came about. 